So 25 years ago, this playground was a park. It's great that it's now a playground, but it was a park. You know, no gates, open to the streets. And this is where, in late July of 1987, half a dozen bike messengers, and then a dozen bike messengers, and then 50 bike riders, including bike messengers, and 100, and 300, and 500, and eventually 1,000, did ride up 6th Avenue to protest and to stop an attempt to ban bicycling in the heart of New York City. That was the restart of bike activism in New York City that not only beat back the bike ban, but that jump-started bike activism in cities across North America. We yeah. became the model for that. Woo! Places like transportation alternatives, we never forgot that it was the messengers who started it when it was tough to just be six or 12 or 20 or 50, who stood up to City Hall, who stood up to the NYPD, who stood up to public opinion, which was scapegoating bike messengers for the traffic ills and danger of New York City. And we together turned the tide of public opinion, we turned the politics, we filed a lawsuit, we stopped the bike ban, we beat Mayor Koch, we beat City Hall, and we went on from there to victory after victory after victory. Yeah. But what we also have to talk about is what happened across the street a month ago when a lifelong New Yorker was run over and killed by an oversized tractor trailer. She might have even been standing on that corner, not even in the crosswalk, when the tractor trailer dragged her under the rear wheels for two blocks up to Carmine Street. As we know, this goes on all the time, and you and we have been and are and will be at the vanguard that is going to turn that around too. And I want to introduce my co-organizer, Keegan Steven. Yeah! Uh, so, if you haven't been on a critical mass ride, a Friday night ride before, you should be aware that the police will ticket you for any minor infraction. Something that you might do on a daily occasion in front of a cop, uh, not get a ticket for, they will ticket you for tonight. Uh, we're going to end at Cooper Union for the screening of... This is Humanity slowly woke to protecting our Earth, the bicycle contributed since the 19th century. Thank you for coming rain or shine like a bike messenger. The artist Dragon Elick videotaped all of Fifth Park and Madison during the street protests of July-August 1987 with interviews from a scheduled but informal forum and Labor Day Parade, plus street footage of couriers demonstrating for Dragon how they rode the avenues. This documentary premiered that October, a stone's throw from here, the Great Hall, across from the public theater in the basement of 432 Lafayette Street on Colonnade Row. Art historian Art W. Moore, who preserved this original copy, is right describing it a document, a slice of life from a period of time whose authenticity even makes me not regret I didn't put everything in. Dragon found real jewels that made this documentary, so thanks to him, I welcome all of you to my little bike messenger's interpretation of history.
On July 22, 1987, New York City Mayor Ed Koch announced an experimental ban of all bicycle traffic from Midtown 5th, Madison, and Park Avenues. The city's bicycle messengers marched in protest. While the mayor contended that such a plan should not affect a messenger's income, the proposed ban was clearly aimed at restricting the movements and, by extension, the commercial freedoms of a vital and pervasive service industry already handicapped by a poor image and general breakdown of public relations. This reputation, that of being reckless and dangerous, is felt by bicycle messengers to be largely undeserved and primarily attributable to a handful of inexperienced and overzealous individuals who, in their pursuit of the almighty dollar, show little regard for either pedestrian or vehicular traffic. In a city that tends to judge quickly and harshly, messengers are understandably anxious about the impression left by the local press and administration. I don't know. I have a feeling that if I weren't on commission, it'd be just a little bit over minimum wage. Really? Yeah. Uh, I have a feeling. I'm not sure. Maybe because you are pro, it doesn't matter for you. You are riding fast or not. You still will do it. Good. Yeah. Good at being careful. Yeah. Uh, the coach will succeed. I think they'll succeed in cracking down on us somehow. Uh, they seem to be doing it now by harassing us with a lot of tickets. Well, having to watch for those policemen that are going to give us tickets means I can't be watching for pedestrians or for cars that are coming my way. Right. I have to try and dodge the cops. The city may have been justified in alerting the public to the dangers of fast bicycles, but in doing so it created a situation where cyclists are now ostracized, made to feel alienated from the very business community they serve. Meanwhile, pedestrians continue to display an alarming lack of caution when negotiating the city streets. They leap indiscriminately through the melee, often stopping short to avoid traffic and thereby providing the speeding messenger with what amounts to a deadly game of hit or miss in a constantly shifting obstacle course. In any event, the messengers are sure to pull the city through another winter before being disposed of. One more casualty in the face of an encroaching computer age. All right, now working as a unit in the past week. And as of yesterday, we were stalling as well. Great. And we have some problems, right? Now we have some problems. The problems are that if you haven't noticed, the police aren't here tonight. All right? I had several people from different directions and different sources tell me that the mayor's office is instructing the police to look for problems. Don't Don't break the law! Don't run the light! Don't run anybody over! The police are looking for an excuse! We gotta keep together. All together. This is no party! This is politics! We're talking about New York may be eliminating those not responsible for the problem. As shown by recent hearings, the city wants to eliminate the fear of accidents caused by bicycle messengers. Unfortunately, efforts to regulate the situation have been sporadic and unorganized. No committees were established, no authority granted, and no money allocated. The truth, of course, is that messengers are independent and will resist unreasonable control there must be intelligent cooperation in any dispute. It's a big city with big problems. Why implement an ineffective accident-producing non-solution? Perhaps it is because the powers that be would rather endorse a hasty and cutthroat policy. Perhaps they have neither the time nor the inclination to work out a reasonable solution. What has happened to the laissez-faire business practices America has embraced all these years? The messengers say it's not their fault when someone is hit. We hardly expect you to believe that, yet they have survived. Perhaps they haven't made life as we would have it in New York possible. Well, prove that they haven't. Show that they are only disposable cogs, and the wheel itself will certainly collapse. The legal process unfolded with characteristic lethargy. <laughs> The coach wants to ban them riding the bike in the city. What do we want? 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 What do
could New York's commerce proliferate in the years since 1975 without the bicycle messenger? No, there aren't hundreds of Horatio Alger stories of messengers pulling themselves up by their bootstraps. Mostly, it's guys working hard for a living, with about 2% of them turning a good wage commensurate to the risk they take and the work they do. Their sport is not conducive to a stadium sport atmosphere, yet they enable this metropolis to move. Nelson Vales was. Some current messengers are close, but none are as fast as the world-class racers. But it is doubtful, without experience, that they are as fast as New York's finest messengers in traffic. And would they carry the packages? Why? Money. They are professional athletes and they deserve what they make. Wages, wages are what's wrong with America. That's why Americans are so lazy. I mean, commissions, messengers work harder than anyone else I've ever seen. That's cool. Except cab drivers. That's why I say cab drivers are our allies. Inspired you to become a messenger. The money. Money? Yeah. And I like to keep in shape. Well, I don't know for like uh, 12 years, since I was uh, like 17, 16 years old. And uh, it really gets you up, you know. Keeps your body moving. How I old? like excitement. How old are you and what is your socioeconomic background? Well, I'm 29. My social economic background is not that bad. I've been on the road for almost 11 years. And you know, it's the same reasons for why I started in the first place. You're more or less free during the day. Various companies and finding it, it was rather difficult, you know, being a minority and, and not or having an opportunity to, to sell my product without first showing them what, what nationality I was. I figured they are the only way that I was going to really make any money to support myself and to maintain an, an economic status that was going to be comfortable for me was to do the thing that I like doing best, and that was riding my bike. I've been messengering now for about three and a half years, and three things have kept me doing it. The first thing is that it makes money for me. The second thing is that it's exciting and it's dangerous, because that's the type of person that I am. And the third thing, which is most important, is that it's fun. I think you're all fucking assholes. Yeah? Okay. Why? Why? Because you're doing this. Why? Why? Why the assholes? I think you're because you're doing this. The chaos of pedestrian traffic is self-evident, and while jaywalking is routine, messengers are painfully aware of who shoulders the ultimate blame when a collision occurs. To a pedestrian, the term right-of-way seems to carry with it a license to move unpredictably and irresponsibly. With caution thrown to the wind, many no longer bother to look both ways before crossing the street. Veteran cyclists are philosophical and do not fault such a chaotic system. They simply adapted. Good at what they do, and they move very fast. Fifth Park and Madison for them, so they they protesting against that. You know what I'm saying? Oh, I see. All those people are messengers? Yeah, messenger yeah, yeah. 3,000 people involved. 3,000 bicyclists? Yeah. yeah what yeah. kind of messengers are they? What do they, what do they uh, transmit? What kind of messengers? They, uh, Communist messengers? No, what? Communist? No, they, they deliver parcels. For what? For Russia? For the Soviet Union? Yeah. Thank you very much. And which the points weren't that bad because they were pretty much the points we knew we were going to lose anyway. Except for one, which is our independent contract ship. We don't want to lose that. If we're going to lose our independent contract ship, we want something written down that we're going to make a base rate that we're going to have an incentive program. You understand? The incentive program will protect the speed and the amount of riders. And also, then they're going to have to come up with health benefits and everything else. Because we don't go nowhere out of our independent country without benefits.
understand? Nowhere without dental, pentagon, medical, and I'm sure you don't believe that. And I'm talking about us covered and our own covered. Right now, the number of people that showing up, it looks negative. But it really isn't, because why not? I don't see people get bored with this. And get tired, see, oh man, I put in my week. I put in my Every winter, New York thanks its lucky stars for the fortitude of the professional messenger for getting the job done. Preferring to imagine themselves as leaderless individualists, they have resisted efforts at unionization. There are certain parallels between messengering and the major leagues of professional sports. Messengers are free agents, able to go from company to company to get the best money possible. Really good dependable riders are naturally paid higher percentages for the work they do. Unfortunately, there is not enough money to create pension funds for a workforce that generates a 90% turnover rate. The market is presently geared primarily for the short-term career messenger whose salary is relative to the work performed. On a harsh winter day, a delivery may take up to three hours to complete, but generally, bicycle messengers provide guaranteed one-hour delivery service. When considering the size of Manhattan, it is easy to see that the four to eight walkers it would take to replace each of the 3,000 bicycle messengers would really add to the congestion. We don't want to change the Just want to ride our bicycle. This guy walked out in front of me. I hollered at him and he didn't hear me. So he just kept on walking and he knocked me into a truck and I broke my shoulder. And it was all his fault. He was crossing in the middle of the block. He wasn't on the crosswalk. He didn't have the lights or nothing. You had the light. I had the light. I had to ride away. And New Yorkers will never lose the need to slow down. He helped me. He was, uh, he was nice for a little while. Where I met her. And then the building attendant asked him, was he with me? And he said no. And he walked away real fast while I was trying to find her. And I never got to see him. The real problem is not bicycles hitting people or injuring people or doing anyone any harm. It's bicycles scaring people. There are only, you know, a lot of horseshoe players out there, you know, because they think close counts. But yeah, that's the big problem, people zooming by them. Oh, you figure that you're, you have the light, you're legal, they're jaywalking, you're going very fast, and, you know, so you go, you go zooming by them, and they get all upset about it. If I got all upset every time a cab almost hit me, you know, I'd spend my whole day in an apoplectic frenzy. Oh, well, it's sure it scares people, it's not rational. Most office workers in New York are so scared by their very lives, just getting up out of bed scares them so much that a bicycle coming, coming. Looking at their shoes. Uh, they're afraid to look up because they've been told if they look up they'll be robbed and, and raped and murdered immediately. So they're not looking around and they're looking at their shoes because they're afraid they'll catch someone's eye. So they're walking along with so scared of just life itself. Then some like crazed guy Go. on a bicycle, some young person making a lot of money, they some kind of deviant group that they're, they're scared of really anyway. Like that, yeah. And the thing is, you see them there in the middle of the street and you keep pedaling. I've had them say that to me so many times. It's like, yes, I keep pedaling. Like, they don't take it personally when the car driver, you know, keeps his foot on the accelerator. His foot. Yeah, and they can't see him, but they can see you there on your bike. So they're like, oh, this guy tried to hit me. And they don't even think about the fact that, you know, they're out in the middle of the street without even looking, and that you didn't hit them, you just almost hit them. And that's the big thing, you know, this almost hitting people, that's what is the root of all the thing. Close doesn't count. If I buy by my skill can evade some moron and wanders out in the street, I should be getting thanks, not abuse. It doesn't make any sense. You've got to cut down on the traffic. There there's you a go. lot of single occupant cars coming from and, the And we don't really, you know... And it's just, there's too many cars. Too many cars, that. too many buses. Yeah, yeah. but you see, I yeah. think messengers in general got to stop being a little more courteous. Well, there are a lot of messengers there's out there that are like, new messengers, they clothes, they buy the bike. Like that they buy the bag and they think, oh, by like running red lights, they become cool. This for 10 years, and I never heard anyone say they wanted to make a career out of it. Ten years a lot of people do. Time, I've seen an awful lot of people make careers out of it, like me. I never considered myself a lifetime messenger or anything. I always, you know, it was always just like, oh, just another month, just another this, just another that. But, you know. hey, what's that, dude? I saw you today. I was, yeah, I was, I was right behind you, but I forgot who you were, and I was like, this is doing the phone.
Castro. Yeah, Castro. 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 Yeah, Castro. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Then when I figured out who he was, he went, uh, I think, up second. Yeah, second. So. He went cut up one way. So you wouldn't like to be lumped in, and I, and I don't appreciate being lumped in with all the crazy riders. I don't care. I don't care. So oh, I do care. I'm going to read just poem. Like I'd rather read Shakespeare. What do you think about the bike? It is Shakespeare. I think they don't give a darn about it. They, they're, they're working by the piece, and they're, they're trying to make as much as they can. What do you mean? Getting hit. Have you ever been hit? Very closely. So you think they're a hazard? I Because we'd like to see safety on the streets for everybody. How many bicyclists are there in existence that do not ride in New York City because they say it's too dangerous to ride in New York? Well, why not make the streets safer for all cyclists to be able to ride and be able to get along well in the city? Why not re-educate the entire public through a mass communications and just re-educate everybody how to have proper street etiquette and just have respect for each other? There, I give you, there's a great number of bicyclists that have no respect. But it's hard to give respect when you get no respect. You want to bring back bike lanes? No, bike lanes is ridiculous. We have a right to a lane, not a bike lane. We have a right to a lane, whatever lane we're in, just like any vehicle on the street. This is our right, but we don't get this right. We get pushed out of the way by cabs, cabs, trucks come right up behind you when you're riding where you, you feel you should be riding. The bicycle lanes are dangerous. They're unsafe. They're terribly kept. There is no upkeep on them at all except for the new paint job they just recently had. Primarily, expect to run into opening doors, pedestrians popping out between, cabs pulling over, trucks pulling out, this, that, and the other on the side lane. It's suicide. That's what we call the side. Suicide. What? All our demonstrations are saying the same thing. Hey, you're interested in safety? Listen to us. We know the streets. We know what's going on. Sit down. Set up a commission. Let's have pedestrians. Let's have bikes. Let's have motor vehicles represented on this commission and sit down and really discuss safety in the city. We do need to get ourselves well, together and it, follow the rule instructions. I get the city on one side and you're on the other side. The police are following nothing more than the umpire. No, That's all we are. Uh, the city, unfortunately, they make the rules and we enforce them. You guys are the police. The peddlers got together. Everybody thought they were unorganized. They got their laws together. They're flourishing now much more than they ever had. They organized. It might cost you five or ten dollars each or something to put a binder up or something. Or if you want to do this business again, you want to take me on a tour in New York again? <laughs> this one? That's all. Just keeping the peace. Just keeping the peace? Keeping the peace. Really? So nice people like you. Nice. <laughs> Thanks. Let's ride our bikes. This is supposed to be America. Freedom. No freedom. Go to Jersey. Let's all go to Jersey. Let's all go to Jersey. Ooh, 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 ooh.
This is another white protest and a series of white protests. And how about enforcing Section 1231 of the State Vehicle and Traffic Law, which guarantees the cyclists the right to the road? We know some cyclists ride assaultively, but that won't change until the police department starts going after the dangerous riders and giving all cyclists the protection of the law instead of just punishment. And we call upon the police commissioner to implement some immediate steps on behalf of safety and the law. A messenger cannot afford not to be the best and to be very fast, for a poor cyclist is not only unprofitable, he is a hazard as well. Maybe the city can ask the world to wait while it catches up. We can't. If the services New York offers can't be offered faster and faster, those services will go elsewhere. Why not accommodate the messenger in these years before the total computer age? Otherwise, it could all be done in Atlanta. Cost is no object when a job must be done. We can't afford the danger inherent to the fast messenger. Some of them say they never hurt anyone. Uh, I think they should be able to work in a certain area. As long as they respect the law and all the lights and everything, I think everything has worked out all right. I think they have a job to do. You like the guys, don't you? Oh, definitely. definitely. I think the majority of them, they do obey the lights and all that. Of course, many clients concerned only that their packages may be receiving less than exclusive treatment. In fact, a messenger is responsible for several customers and many packages at a time. And all a skilled rider can complete an amazing number of runs in a very brief period, covering many miles in a matter of minutes. The fast messenger would like to defend himself by saying, I can calculate all the lights. I do not intend to scare you. But can you pay me what I'm worth? The skills I have, to be as good as I am, is not easily duplicated. Problems are caused by everyone who mimics me because you don't know when something will happen. I depend on knowing before it happens. New York is tough. Pay me what I'm worth and I'll do what I can. I've, I've always been amazed because messengers are always going faster than I am. And some of them obviously are professional riders. I mean, in terms of you can just tell the style that they ride, fluid. Whatever. It's always sort of been of interest. And also, I used to have a bike helmet. I mean, I still wear one. I had one that I had painted. And it was coincidence because there was this one messenger that had done a kind of a similar thing. And I always sort of picked up on that. You know, you see these guys for years climb the avenue. I don't know how they do it. You know, Koch has a tendency to go after weak groups. You don't see him going after the real estate uh, people. And he calls Trump in names. But I mean, he's really completely beholden to that interest. And the messengers are really, what easier group to stomp on? I had an interesting conversation with this guy. He sits in his office and looks down at Times Square and sees the cyclists. And he was saying he's for the, you know, registration and everything. Thing, but he depends entirely on the messengers for, his, for him to make more money. And he said he would be really in trouble. And he relies on it. That person demonstrates the break. Okay. And that's, okay, that's great news. That'll be good news to the track riders because the most efficient bike would be a track bike with handbrakes. Right. That would be like oh, double, be double, ones, double yeah. triple brakes. Yeah. The other ones are set in 1973 with clean air air. Like I said, we have extended a lot more than 10 years. So let's get a real solution. We're all for it. And we have a lot of solutions to throw out to you, and you can take some, reject others, but we're professionals. We're on the road every day, so we know what we're talking about. It's not like we're talking out of our shoes. All right, we're talking out of our bicycle seats. <laughs> it really depends. The, one, the ones who laugh become very good at it. It's because they realize that their bike is their life. Because if there's something wrong with their bike, it's their pay. People, they people, they people, people, they people they scare people. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, they scare people. Yes, right. Because they that's they their only the real problem.
for the director who is uh, in Europe and couldn't be with us. Uh, Dragon Ilyik. The leader of the uprising, the, the great, resourceful, and indomitable uh, field general, media genius, uh, and Greek god of the battle against the Vikings, Steve Greek. In any event such as this, there is one indispensable person who not only grasps the big picture, but sees to the hundreds of details and who inspires everyone else to care, to participate, and to contribute. It's been a privilege to work alongside a truly inspiring organizer who's going to chair uh, our panel, the volunteer coordinator for Time's Up, Keegan Stephen. Thanks, Charlie. That was a very generous introduction. Bill from Time's Up who got me involved with Time's Up. Uh, Barbara Rossi is here who got me involved with Occupy Wall Street. I'll say here. This was 25 years ago that he was organizing these direct action rides. I recently spoke with someone who was one of the lead organizers of Critical Mass in San Francisco 20 years ago. Happy birthday, Critical Mass. Charlie's been doing great stuff for so long, He's still doing it. We're still pushing the envelope, and that's why we're here tonight. You guys might not recognize him without the amazing hair. Uh, this is Steve Creek of Finios. He owns a bike messenger company, rides his bike every day, still on the streets. Next to him is Tom Monroe. He's a current bike messenger and amazing organizer of a lot of events in, in bike messenger culture. <laughs> Alec Pat. Uh, next to Tone is Monica Duncan. Uh, leader and inspiration to all of us. Uh, next to Monica is Caroline Sampanero, Director of Bicycle Advocacy for Transportation Alternatives. Next to Caroline is Laura Solis. She's uh, representing We Bike, uh, Women's Empowerment Through Bicycle. Charlie McCorkle. Former president of Transportation Alternatives and founding owner of Bicycle Habitat. Hi, crowd. Lincoln Pope. We're all just like working to get bikes on the road. It's this ancient machine that's very basic, and so we're all like dedicating our whole lives to it. I would like us to evaluate why. Why do we bike? Why do we fight for bikes? Why did all that organizing energy go into it? Why are these incredibly smart, passionate individuals spending their whole lives trying to get more bikes on the road? What's up, guys? What happened was the whole bike band situation started from a very simple place. An elderly gentleman made a right turn from the middle lane on Park Avenue. Ambulance came and took care of the old man and then everybody took off and left me laying there on the corner. <laughs> and I lived down to Houston Street with a 40 ounce of beer and met up with my friend Shut Up Chuck. And Shut Up Chuck had gotten door that day. A woman from the Times happened to be there on the corner and walked over to us and asked us, what we thought about the bike band. And we were like, what the what? And she told us about the bike band and 40 ounces more or less gone. And I, I like to pontificate on a 40 ounce of beer. And the next day I showed up and there was a bunch of news trucks and about 100 messengers. But uh, that first day I talked 11 guys into blocking off 6th Avenue and we rode up to 57th Street and blocked traffic the whole way and came down. Fifth Avenue and block traffic, and then we just took off from there. Uh, everybody came out of uh, Steve Stallman, because uh, without the 49 East House, we'd have no base of operation. <laughs> Charles the other end, uh, supplemented my income so I didn't have to go to work so I could do the fight. Came out, everybody said, No, 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 communists. I said, No, 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 printing. Communists printing, they print. <laughs> and they hand it out for you. Good communists, they print for you. What kind of message? Uh, communist message? For the Soviet Union? For Russia? In today's standards, let me back away from you know, the old days and the flick that was there. Thank you very much. You know, we all see the bike lanes that are out there today and how little they're respected. Why create something if you're not going to maintain them? Uh, it's simple, but I also believe that those bike lanes should be optional for people that need them. And those of us that don't should be free to ride because we're taxpayers. And <laughs> Can I stand up? No, I'm not good sitting down. I never yes. was. 
shirt from back in the day. My daughter, 17 years old, Madison. My son likes it. I guess you guys get it. Madison said, pick your shirt, Dad. Wear it. So I'm doing what she wanted. Because any father listens to their 17-year-old daughter. Compromising. You know, all our lives growing up, we all compromise, let go of ideals as we get older to exist. But we all compromise and give up little pieces. And this is some place where we have to come back to and not compromise because you have to stand firm somewhere. Getting cars out of the city and bikes into the city is a very strong point. But another thing I'd like to touch on is self-entitlement. We live in a city that that should be our national motto, or a city motto, I'm sorry, not national. That we're a city of self-entitled people and everybody walks around as such. We bicyclists break the law. We break the law, uh, but everybody breaks the law. They get as far as they can. Jaywalkers, cars running through the orange, red, light. If you're gonna enforce stuff, I believe that you should enforce it 100% or let us all go. And, you know, thanks for showing up. It's good to see people that really feel. So thank you very much. It's really hard to explain from a messenger's perspective because I ride every day, even on my off days, and it doesn't really matter where I go, you're always going to deal with poor cycling etiquette, pedestrians in bike lanes, cops in bike lanes, horse shit in bike lanes, you just can't win. Honestly, from my perspective, I ride my bike because I love it more than anything else in this world next to my mother and my girlfriend and my dog. And looking at everybody here, like I'm seeing maybe like 60% of people that I see every day cycling. And you may not notice because you may never see dreads, you may see a hoodie and shades. It's our city and you know, cars suck, yo. So let's try and unite as a community of cyclists, commuters, bike messengers, posengers, bakingers. We all can work this all out together. So I started biking in New York City um, in 2004 in the, the height of the Republican National Convention. You know, at that time, the spaces were really opening up. They felt like you could just talk, to, I could talk to any stranger, like, wow, this is really crazy, right? And it just felt like so, so energized. And the public space was being reawakened. And to start biking in that was, was just a, a really invigorating thing. It was, it's immediately politicizing to ride a bike in New York City because you're, you're facing so many aggressors. But, but you all noticed how hot this summer was all around the world? You all noticed how there was no snow this winter? Climate is changing, and bikes are something we can do something about. Forty percent of the trips in America are less than two miles, and everyone's driving those, right? But we can bike those, and we can make our world a little bit more livable. Thanks, Keegan. I'm Charlie. When I started riding my bike in New York City, I was in college, and I fell in love with New York City as soon as I started riding my bike, and I never really stopped. And because of riding my bike, I started to meet really amazing people. Now George Bliss, Charlie Kamenov, Noah Budnick, who I work with, Phil DePaulo. Uh, tons of amazing people that were doing all this great organizing with their bikes, and this was like, aha. Uh -huh. Obviously not a new idea, but the reason I am drawn to bikes is because I think that they're natural organizing tools, which we all know. In cities all over the world, people are using bikes to try and make better cities, and so I'm happy to be a part of that work with you all. I actually started riding my bike just last summer because I wanted to get somewhere that wasn't accessible by public transportation. And a guy was like, hey, we should ride our bikes there. And I was like, oh, okay. So I got my dusty, foldable Peugeot, way too small for me, and rode it in traffic, afraid for my life, down Flatbush Avenue for the very first time. And on the way back home, I was like, uh, shoot! I need to do this all the time! It has changed my entire life. It started out with just being convenient, but then it became fun. Now my legs are even more awesome than they used to be. And all these things are a result of me riding my bike, and I want everybody else to feel that warm and fuzzy feeling that I feel every day that I get on my bike. And then I continue to try and spread the good word, the gospel of the bicycle. So, Sometimes you realize you've been around a long time. I see this movie and I know I have. You know, if everybody would just take a second to indulge me. I saw one messenger I know who died in the early 1990s. And I saw another one that I'm pretty sure did die also in the 1990s. And these guys were in the film and they were out protesting. I'd just like to take a second to just be quiet.
And I guess that's part of the reason why I've done what I've done over the years. I'd like to thank the person in the audience who never gets thanked and has done so much behind the scenes work for cycling. The pilot I was on the bike hand, he was instrumental in me. The guy who set up the meeting. My friend Roger Hurd, sitting over here in the front seat. I, I went to the school, I went to Cooper Union. I bought my first, I, I learned to ride bike when I was seven. It got stolen about a week later. Uh, I didn't ride a bike again until I was 20. I knew I wanted to ride the subway again. Went over the side of some bikes and bought a three speed. I knew on the way home that I had a secret. That bicycles were <laughs> great. They were just the greatest thing in the world. I, I ride my bike back in the next day and I looked at the skyline over Manhattan. And it's hard to picture it today, but it was yellow. We had so much sulfur in our air that it was just, I, I feel like I'm going there and I'm breathing this stuff on a regular basis. And the evolution guidelines were just being put out by the federal government. Jane Jacobs was good, was big. She was talking about neighborhoods and bringing New York City back to a community. I, I absorbed that stuff. There was a guy named Ivan Village writing about bikes in a small world and how great bikes are for all the problems that we have today. Do we talk about our you know, fuel consumption in the United States, about how our streets are misused, how it's not appropriately allocated. The balance is way shifted too far to the wrong side. We need to bring it further back to the center. You know, it's important stuff. People who don't have enough money to bring it to eat, and they have to spend five bucks a day on subways. I think that they don't believe in it. I like to think that the bicycle plays a very small role in solving an awful lot of very big problems. I believe that we can solve the problems as cyclists. We've come so far, it bogs my mind. I like to see all these books here because we're all in it for the long haul. Man. Charlie Coleman. Uh, he came up, told me about a group called Transportation Alternatives, and I started taking everybody's names and phone numbers that came to protest. And I gave Charlie the book. I go, here you go, Charlie, Transportation Alternatives. He did a beautiful job, and I think he deserves a, a big job. Every single panelist connected biking with something way bigger. And Caroline said, tool for social change. We saw Steve using that in that film. What are the forces fighting against that? For insurance companies. Trying to license messengers. That means they'll end up being insured, or like cars are insured. And pretty soon your 12 year old won't be able to go out on his swing. And it's just ridiculous. Bicycle is supposed to be about freedom. Of like this two miles wide because they're lazy and that's their own issue. But as for cycling, just do it. It's like nowadays, like a sheer inconvenience. I know every one of us has got like some sort of summons for running a red light or jumping on the sidewalk or going the opposite way. They toss the case out. You lose like, those eight to ten hours of work. People are afraid of things they don't know, things that are new to them. People are afraid of their own bodies. There's a huge disconnect in fighting people's love of cars and being isolated. I mean, driving in cars is fun, right? A lot of people are spending a lot of time and hours and days in cars, isolated, listening to their radio show, eating food and drinking Coca-Cola, and on their cell phones are good. And we're getting more and more isolated and into ourselves. And biking, you're immediately engaged. Places where cops are on bikes, there tends to be less crime. That's because they're engaging with the community more. They're not stuck in their cars. Because we've never won anything in this country without fighting for it to the nail, right? On our bikes. These streets are the avenues of commercial and business as usual. If we're there, we can change the conversation. We can change and create this kind of city that we want. I'm a little shy to talk about history in a room full of total history buffs, but one thing I've found to be kind of interesting in looking back on archives, the total outrage that New Yorkers had when their streets and sidewalks were being taken over by cars. There was a period where we were, cars were being forced upon us as New Yorkers in this country. It took a lot of work to get the car embedded in the way that it's been embedded. So. My reason for starting my response with that is just to say that I think that the work we're doing is like chipping away at this massive, obviously, engine that's that's been embedded here. I think that the key to the change is as many different tactics as possible, all targeting the same bullseye. Banning the word accident from your vocabulary because their crash is not accident. <laughs> so I realize that you are a role model. I take a lane. Me, myself, and I take an entire lane because this is how much room I need. And remember that other people are watching and hopefully they'll follow suit with you. She deserves the entire lane.
<laughs> and I think our victory is inevitable. What are our stumbling blocks? How many people here are aware that we lost our national bike funding this last spring? All the money that, that created New York City's bike lanes, the bike maps, the bike parking, the free helmet program, and the list goes on, gone. Absolutely gone. They'd like to bring us back to 1941 or 1923 or whatever. We're not going there. Why? You're in New York City. Bicycling is not as mainstream as it is in Montana. We, we're lucky. We have a great city here, we have a great DOT commissioner, things are happening. But one of the things we have to be careful about is villainizing our own. We saw it here in the film tonight. In 1987, we villainized Steve. He was a bike master. That was the lowest of the low life of anybody. He still is. Let me tell you. <laughs> Today, who do we villainize? We villainize the guy bringing your Chinese food to you. We villainize the guy bringing the Mexican food. We villainize the immigrants in the street and work with them and make them as mainstream as we are. So we have to be careful about allowing anybody to villainize the people who are working on their bikes. That's really important when you think about it. But there's always going to be people who hate bikes. We need to move forward. So whether it's Schumer's wife fighting us on the bike lanes on Park to Park South, or whether it's people who don't want the bike lane on Columbus Avenue, don't worry about it. Keep riding, keep doing the right stuff. Our victory is inevitable. Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're all beautiful and wonderful. Let's let's develop a master plan. There, there is a bike master plan. 1997. Master plans get out of date the minute finished. Something that TA started pushing. It's 20 is plenty. That would probably be the best thing that could ever happen in the cycle and the best thing in the And any neighborhood is able to get a large enough petition together you can do anything with any street you want with your council. You can close the street down, period, to <laughs> car traffic. And actually that's a really nice segue. Albert is collecting letters for 5th and 6th Avenue bike lanes. Thank you. Formula downtown and City Hall. A phone call is worth a thousand people feeling the same way. A letter is worth 10,000 people people feel the same way. So it's all about them getting reelected. The more the constituents they feel feel that way according to the map, that's how it goes. And what TA is doing to make sure we keep the strides that we've made so far. And look just to think about how we can specifically start to target candidates in individual meetings. We did a poll last year. Our city council is turning over quite considerably as well. It's not just a new mayor and a new commissioner. It's also a majority in the city council. So we're looking at those races. I think it busts a lot of myths that electeds have about what voters think. Voters support bike lanes. Right now, brainstorming a small get out the vote style campaign, working with young people, that it's really important they're making the phone calls and writing the letters because electeds are only hearing from people that are unhappy. Because happy people are happy and they're out riding their bikes. They're not calling and complaining or going to the community board meeting. It's on all our shoulders to be loud, to continue to bring our voices to the attention of these folks at City Hall or at City Council because you know what we've seen in the media over the last couple of years is that press cycles will come and go. They're going to be on our side for a while and then they're going to be bad. The media has no memory. So really, you know, it, it's on us to bring our voices to these people. That people aren't at least going the right way. Minimum of safety, you know, what's the issue with respect to the electric bikes? Because I'm riding at night, it's like a head-on collision with a motorcycle. That takes a lot of the fun away from me, and it discourages a lot of people. I go around the corner, and there's somebody coming the wrong way that could crash into me, so I've got to peer around the corner before I can make a turn. I'm, I'm a huge believer in the social contract. I'm a bigger believer in changing the social contract. We need to have a city that doesn't incentivize people to go the wrong way. Incentivize people to run red lights. Unfortunately, the city is not set up for bike riders. But I think we need to change those rules and regulations. Like I said, 20 is money. And all of a sudden, nobody has an incentive to run that red light because there's gonna be 15 more in front of you before the light changes again. If we had two-way streets for bike riders, and by full thought, you wouldn't have to ride the wrong way. You would know where people are coming from. Like, just watch how you ride. Like, you can't tell everybody what to do. Not everybody's going to listen to what you got to say in the rules. Right now, like, Manhattan is free game. I work as a messenger. I've been the messenger in this city since 1998. And I've been riding every day, all four seasons. 
not April to August. I'm talking January to December only. So I've seen a lot of changes, and you know, people are gonna do what they're gonna do. And if you tell a food delivery guy, hey, you're going the wrong way, you don't pay my bills. Your answer is to condone the answer. Before Tom jumps out of his skin. All right, it's, it's, it's very, very simple. I, I understand your beef, and, and nobody wants to be scared when they're riding their bike. But the reality is, out there, there are no rules. All right. I just think it's a matter of everyone realizing that we're all responsible for one another. It's not productive. When you start yelling at people, they start yelling back, it becomes divisive. And, and the way to make the changes that we want to see is by not yelling, staying positive, making the changes that we know will solve these problems. And it's not getting that. It's getting a 20 mile per hour speed limit in New York City. It's getting two-way bike lanes. It's getting the infrastructure, uh, solving the failures that are leading to these problems, like going the wrong way, speeding, hitting people. There is a huge community out there, but yay bike NYC hashtag. You know, how do we actually get rid of passenger cars and just have public transportation, bikes, and then commercial vehicles? Up for New York, let's go for it. Congestion pricing? Does that ring a bell with anybody? We've almost totally kicked the cars out of our parks. We've claimed how many lanes of traffic. We can no longer afford to subsidize the car. Why is it like Amsterdam? Paris. Think of a think that their next step up is to an automobile. Their next step up is to a bicycle. I really like riding fast in traffic. It's a lot of fun. At the same time, I love the idea of New York as a cycling city like those northern European cities with that kind of model share. And I tend to think you can't really have both. Then which do you pick? The Wild West in New York City in the 1980s or the future? Amsterdam. I bike around the world a lot. It's just the way of life there. I mean, there's mothers biking with a baby here and a baby there, and she's eating a sandwich and talking on the phone, and it's like no, no problem. Like everybody is, is just so comfortable with that. I really missed biking in New York City. I couldn't go fast, I stop at all the lights, and be in the small narrow lane. God, this is just so unradical and uncool. <laughs> the rogue New Yorker that, you know, like it feels here, where you've got that energy and that excitement and you're on the edge all the time. And how are we fighting to get into this program structured, boring bicycling that there is in these other cities that are so much more advanced than us? <laughs> I don't really know how we split that difference. I think we need a little bit of pull. Well, we can all write a letter to our council people. <laughs> I think you may be missing the zipping around the cars with the sensation of how much faster and better you are than me. And yep. that's going to go away. God, I hope that's going to go away. And I hope you can do 20 miles an hour on any of the streets that we have without having to worry about the car door opening, without a driver making a journey from one lane to another, without you having to squeeze in between two lanes. I don't think you miss the speed. I think you miss the adrenaline. And sorry, but it's going to go. Like, I know my mom is not, you know, I use my mom because actually I have been trying to get her right, but, and, you know, she's scary. And actually, the more I ride here, the slower I ride. So, I hope it's not either or. Yeah, just, I like to ride fast too, like as a messenger, like when you're holding like a whole bunch of packages and there's, I know my man Davey D knows, when we have a package in the bag, that client's fate is in, the, in our hands. And if we get there late, then like client might lose. So, would I like to go back to that wild, wild west? Yeah. <laughs> One of my best friends in the world, Johnny Remy. I just had surgery and I'm afraid to get back. Like, then Amsterdam, I would get back on the bike. I ride, in, I think, in Central Park. Don't ride in Central Park. No. <laughs> Listen, it's, it's not the other bikers you have to fear. It's the cars. The and our bike lanes just are not wide enough, not protected enough. They're extended sidewalks to a lot of people. Bike messengers, I was a bike messenger for three days. I don't know why I did that, or why I did that. Temporary <laughs> insanity, <laughs> not sure. But exactly. Uh, you go back to self entitlement road bike guy and I thought I was pretty much watching my language when I used the great New York phrase, schmuck. He wanted to throw down with me right there on the street. And I just stood there grinning. I said, I actually have a life to go back to. But that's the attitude between pedestrians and cars. Bikes don't have a place. A bicycle messenger harassing you as you're crossing the street. Someone had a personal friend with Tony. It's, it's all love. I said that to you or something? Well, I mean, if you're going to be insulting one group of people, why not just generalize the insults just across the board? I mean, I've had multiple intersections with bicycle messengers, 
harassing me as I'm crossing the street. Saying what? I'm saying what? I haven't got that much. I mean, it's not you, and it's not the people from New Jersey, and it's not the cars. It's just this misconception that there is no place on the street for cyclists. Right. Period. Okay, I, I just want to say I actually agree with you on some point because I was going to say I feel like it may have generalized. <laughs> A bit. Because you're right though, and I've also had the car that honks at me, and at the car I say thank you, you just let me know you see me, I feel safer, I'm gonna keep on going. But let's just keep in mind that not everyone knows what to do with a, a bike. Like there's still a novelty for some reason, let alone a woman on a bike. I think we need to let go of that novelty. There's nothing spectacular, I mean I'm spectacular, but there's nothing spectacular about someone being on a bicycle. It's just as normal as someone walking, but I think that's not the case for everyone and they still think that it's something that needs to be all that, so that's why they stop in the lane and they can just look at you because you're so amazing. Okay, yeah. I want to thank all the Times Up volunteers who helped us put this together. Please consider becoming a member of Times Up. On July 22, 1987, Mayor Koch stood on the steps of New York City Hall and declared that bicycling would be banned on 5th, Park, and Madison Avenues. The ban was an attack on bike messengers who were being scapegoated for the general dangerous and congested streets of New York City. Fortunately, this unfair treatment of one subgroup of cyclists struck a nerve and brought together the cycling community in a spirit of direct action that helped usher in an era of masses of cyclists spread across 6th Avenue and paraded at three miles from Houston Street to Central Park South. Our stately pace, perhaps, was slow enough that passerby could look past our bikes and see our bodies and faces. Walkers and joggers could join our ranks. We were slow enough that we could and did stop at red lights. You now letting foot and auto traffic cross at the green light was a stroke of genius. It's certified cycling at City Friendly. September 28, 2012. We'll celebrate the 25th anniversary of this 1987 bicycle uprising and 20th anniversary of the first critical mass bike ride. To scapegoat the flag while draped in it exposes the underlying deceit behind the whitewashing of history. Kneeling did not offend the American flag nor harm peace officers' symbolic value. The unethical arrogance that inspired the protest is what's most offensive. I'm prouder of the flag for what the protest meant, rather than blind faithfully defending the flag's honor as if the power to wash away sin resides there.